Welcome back. So in this second lecture, we're going to begin our search for co-dimension two analogs of the allen kahn equations by looking at a beautiful family of PDEs called the complex ginsburg landau equations. So historically, these equations have their origin in Vitaly Ginsburg and Lev Landau's work on phase transitions and superconductivity. As you can imagine, this is not going to be a lecture about superconductivity. Uh, however, the study of the geometric features of these equations, and by which I mean really the relation to harmonic maps and minimals of manifolds, begins in earnest in the 1990s with the work of Bethwell, Brzee, and Elaine. And that's really where our story is going to begin for the purposes of these lectures. So a quick warning, in different areas of math and physics, people use Ginsburg-Landau equations or Landau-Ginsburg equations to refer to many different families of PDEs, which include the allen kahn equations we talked about in lecture one, and the abelian yang mills higgs equations that we're going to talk about in lecture three. Okay, And while all of these families are formally and historically related, uh, they have very different analytic and geometric properties, so be careful when perusing the literature. The literature. Here we're referring to a specific family of BDEs for complex valued maps. Okay, so from a geometer's perspective, what's the motivation for looking at uh, these BDEs? So let's consider the unit circle inside of the complex plane bounding the unit disk. So given the map from S1 to itself, for instance, the identity, uh, a natural question for geometers and analysts is whether there exists some best extension, some optimal in whatever sense, of G to the unit disk. So how could we determine optimal? Well, if we just ask for a complex valued extension, then the natural candidate would be the harmonic extension, right? So we can extend G into the disk, um, minimize energy among all such extensions, uh, and, and end up with a harmonic map to C, uh, which coincides with G on the boundary, okay? But what if we require the extension to take values in S1? So we can strain our problem a little more. We start out with this S1 valued map, and instead of asking for an extension which just takes values in C, we require that the extension continue to take values in the unit circle. So can we minimize among all S1 valued extensions to arrive at a geometrically optimal S1 valued map coinciding with G on the boundary? Okay, so this kind of problem brings us to the realm of harmonic maps. So a map U from some manifold M to some manifold N, um, which is a local minimizer or just a critical point for the Dirichlet energy, among n valued maps, so maps constrained to take values in this target manifold n, is called a harmonic map to n. Okay, so these are maps that are critical for the Dirichlet energy among nearby maps which take values in this fixed target manifold. So thus, we're asking about the existence of harmonic S1 valued extensions uh, of a given map from S1 to itself. Okay? So, if uh, our map from S1 to S1 has the form e to the i phi for some real valued function phi, so i.e. it has degree zero, it's homotopically trivial, it's not hard to see that the function uh, e to the i psi from the disk to S1, where psi is just the real valued harmonic extension of this uh, real valued function phi, is going to be an energy minimizing S1 valued extension. So indeed, this is an S1 valued map, which will minimize energy among all S1 valued extensions of this boundary map G. Okay, so in particular, if G from S1 to itself is homotopic to a constant, so it has degree zero, then there exists a smooth harmonic S1 valued extension in the unit disk. Okay, however, if G from S1 to itself is homotopically non-trivial, so it has non-zero degree, then we know that G can't have any continuous extension. If it had a continuous extension inside the disk, well then this would give us a homotopy to the constant, right? So with a bit more work though, uh, one can in fact show that not only does it have no continuous extension, but in fact it has no extension of finite energy. So we can't hope to minimize energy among even singular solutions uh, to produce an extension because there is no extension of finite energy to minimize. Okay. On the other hand, we can find extensions of this map which are harmonic away from some singular points. They're just forced to have some energy blow up. So a question we can still ask is, is there some variational principle which is going to select the best among these singular extensions. Okay, so I think it's time for a picture. So if this boundary map G is just the identity, it's the identity map from S1 to itself, what are some possible singular harmonic extensions? Okay, so the most natural one, the first one you would come up with, is the following. So if we want to extend the identity map to a map from the disk to S1, well, the simplest thing we could do is take each point Z in the disk, 
and send it to Z over modulus C. Okay, so clearly if modulus C is one, this is just the identity on the, on the boundary S1. But inside, we're just sending Z to the nearest point in the unit circle, shooting it out radially. Clearly, we're gonna have a singularity at the origin here. And that singularity is gonna force us to have infinite energy, right? It's, it's easy to see this map is gonna have uh, energy blowing up around the origin. That being said, away from the origin, it is a nice harmonic map. On the other hand, for any collection of points, say uh, Z1 through ZK inside the disk, and any collection, collection of integers kappa1 through kappa k, we can find a singular harmonic map extending the identity uh, of the form given here, which is gonna have, be, uh, have singularities exactly at these points Z1 through ZK, and it's gonna wind around them, so with degree kappa i around each point zi. Okay, so we can all, and it can be harmonic away from, uh, away from those singularities. Okay, so there are many possible um, singular harmonic extensions. Uh, you know, at least as many as there are finite collections of points in the disk, right, and uh, sums of integers uh, which equal to one. Okay, so clearly there's gonna be infinitely many possible singular harmonic extensions. So how can we select the best one? So here we get to the definition of the complex Ginsburg Landau energy. So given a complex valued map on some, now we'll just say we're on a manifold M, but we can still think about the disk if you want for now. Then the epsilon Ginsburg Landau energy, E epsilon of U, is gonna be half the Dirichlet energy, plus uh, again, a nonlinear potential over epsilon squared, where this nonlinear potential is going to look formally like what we saw for the Allen Kahn case, but remember now that we're looking at a complex parameter. So W of Z is gonna be a quarter, one minus norm Z squared squared, right? So in the, uh, in the real valued case, this was telling us that it was gonna force our function to want to be plus or minus one. Now, since we're complex valued, that nonlinear potential is gonna want our, fun our map to take values close to the unit circle in the, in the complex plane, right? It's gonna want U uh, to have modulus close to one. Okay. And in particular, if U does take values in the unit circle, the note that this E epsilon of U is just the Dirichlet energy, right? This potential term drops out. And now we just have the Dirichlet energy on S1 valued maps. So clearly this is going to be uh, related to the variational theory uh, for the Dirichlet energy on S1 valued maps, this harmonic map to S1 problem that we were talking about. Of course, in general, um, this potential term for taking values off, off of S1, this potential term is going to penalize us. And as epsilon gets smaller, it's gonna penalize us more and more and more, okay? So an idea, if we wanna find this best singular harmonic extension of a map G from S1 to itself with non-zero degree, is we can try minimizing this Ginsburg-Landau energy among complex valued extensions. We know complex valued extensions exist and we can uh, certainly minimize energy among these guys. And then try to understand what happens in the limit as epsilon goes to zero. The idea being that somehow in the limit, um, this is gonna pull our extension to be S1 valued and then this Dirichlet term is gonna force it to be somehow the best among these S1 valued extensions. Okay. And this was done by Beth Whale, Brazil, and Elaine in the 90s. So what they showed is that for a given smooth G from S1 to itself, we can minimize the epsilon Ginsburg Landau energy to get maps U epsilon to satisfy the following. So first of all, the minimal energy of those maps is gonna be exactly pi times the modulus of degree of G, which we'll call D, times log one over epsilon, plus terms which are bounded as epsilon goes to zero. So energy is gonna blow up like log one over epsilon, um, and the coefficient to that blow up is gonna be exactly pi times the norm of the degree with a boundary map. Okay, moreover, that map u epsilon is going to converge smoothly away from a collection of d singular points, where d is just the norm of the degree of g, a1 through ad, to a harmonic s1 valued extension, um, u star, which is gonna be harmonic away from those singular points, Moreover, those singular points are uh, constrained by the following. They're going to have to minimize a certain logarithmic interaction energy uh, determined by the boundary data G. So this minimization problem for these ginsburg landau energies in the limit is going to give us a singular harmonic extension. We know that that singular harmonic extension is going to have exactly D, norm of degree G, singular points. And we get some strong constraints on where those singular points can lie. Okay, so it is selecting some kind of best singular harmonic extension. And for example, uh, if G is the identity map from S1 to itself, 
then as we thought from that uh, picture a couple slides back, the U star Z that's going to be the best uh, according to this variational principle is going to be exactly that radial extension Z over modulus Z, okay? So the one that looks nicest geometrically is the one that's selected. All right. So let's uh, take a look at kind of what's going on here. So what's a cartoon version of the epsilon minimizer of the ginsburg landa energy when our boundary map is just the identity? So it's going to look something like the following. So outside of, say, an O of epsilon disk around the origin, we can try just taking U epsilon of Z to be the limit map that we expect, right? So the Z over modulus Z. Okay, so we can, for instance, take it to be Z over modulus C on the annulus where norm of Z is uh, between epsilon and one. So this annulus running from radius epsilon to radius one here. Inside, we'll want to regularize this somehow, right? Because we're looking for uh, honest, smooth, complex valued extensions, right? And so inside, we can just say, take uh, U epsilon of Z to be Z over epsilon, okay? On, the, on this disk of radius epsilon about the origin. This isn't going to be the exact minimizer. It's just a cartoon picture, but it's a pretty good cartoon. Okay, so we see this kind of split into this annular region uh, where U epsilon looks like the limiting singular S1 valued harmonic map. And this epsilon neighborhood of the zero set where U epsilon is taking values far from S1. Okay, now exercise, you can check that on this annular region, the energy contribution is gonna be exactly pi times log one over epsilon, assuming epsilon is um, you know, less than one, uh, plus O of one. So it's gonna be pi log one over epsilon plus terms that are bounded as epsilon goes to zero, okay? And then on this, uh, this interior epsilon disk, um, you can check that the energy contribution is going to be bounded as epsilon goes to zero. So in contrast in particular to the Allen Kahn equations, where all the action was gonna be at the epsilon scale around the zero set, what we're seeing here is that somehow all of the action is in small annuli uh, where the radius is larger than epsilon, um, but still small, and um, where our map looks like a harmonic S1 valued map, okay? So that's a cartoon picture of a minimizer in this case. So in two dimensions in particular, we see that minimizing solutions to these Ginsburg-Landau energies, whose energy looks like O of log epsilon, converge to singular S1 valued harmonic maps, whose singularities are determined variationally. In higher dimensions, so three and above, um, a similar phenomenon shows up for E epsilon minimizers, where the singularities of the limit maps now resemble n minus two dimensional submanifolds, right? And the variational problem determining their location roughly corresponds to minimization of the n minus two area functional. So the first results in this direction were proved by uh, Tristan Rivière and later by uh, Fangua Lin and Tristan Rivier via a direct asymptotic analysis of these E epsilon minimizing maps using PDE techniques. So roughly speaking, uh, they show that E epsilon minimizers on say the n-dimensional ball, whose energy grows like uh, O of log epsilon, exhibit energy concentration on area minimizing integral n minus two currents, which we defined in uh, lecture one, right? So in particular, um, by minimizing E epsilon for suitably chosen boundary data on the boundary sphere, uh, these E epsilon minimizers can be used to solve the co-dimension co two plateau problem. So you can you know, prescribe your n minus three uh, boundary current in the boundary sphere, and then use these Ginsburg-Landau guys to produce uh, the energy minimizing n minus two current as the singularity of this limiting harmonic map. Okay. So another way that we can understand the relationship between minimization of these Ginsburg-Landau functionals and minimization of the n minus two area is through a gamma convergence framework and through the work of Gerard and Sonner and Alberti, Baldo, and Orlandi. And for this, the central object of interest is going to be the Jacobian of these complex valued maps. So recall that the Jacobian, Ju of a complex valued map on M, is just going to be the pullback of the area two form from the plane. Okay, so in particular, Ju is just du1 wedge du2. Or alternatively, it's useful to notice that this is the same as half d of u1 du2 minus u2 du1, which we could also write as half the exterior derivative of the pullback of r squared d theta from the plane. Okay. We can view this two form ju as an n minus two current, since given any n minus two form, we can integrate ju wedge zeta, right, over m. And if we recall our uh, coarea formula for complex valued maps, 
if we have a complex value maps taking values in the unit disk, then the co-area formula tells us that this pairing ju with zeta is exactly the integral over every y in the disk of the integral of zeta over the n minus two submanifold given by the pre-image of y under u. So when we pair ju with zeta, we're getting the average integral of zeta over the level sets of u, okay? Now intuitively, if we have some family u epsilon of complex valued maps, or maps specifically taking values in the unit disk, whose level sets uh, for y bounded away from one are collapsing along a given n minus two submanifold, say gamma as epsilon goes to zero, then from the co-area formula, we might expect that the limit as epsilon goes to zero of this pairing of ju epsilon with zeta is gonna be the integral overall of y in the disk of the limit as epsilon goes to zero of the pairing of the integral of zeta over the uh, level set uh, u epsilon inverse of y, all right? But we said, if these level sets are collapsing to this n minus two submanifold gamma, well, then that limit should be just the integral over gamma of zeta. So we get the integral over d2 of the integral of zeta over gamma. So what we would end up with is just, uh, I said two pi, but that should be pi is the area of the disk, pi times the area of uh, the integral of zeta over gamma, okay? And it turns out that something kind of like this happens for every family u epsilon uh, with Ginzburg-Landau energies bounded above by a constant times log epsilon as epsilon goes to zero. So given such a family with this energy bound, um, it turns out that uh, we do get concentration of level sets in some sense on average along a limiting n minus two cycle. And moreover, this cycle, the really striking part is that its area is bounded above by the limit of these epsilon energies over pi log epsilon, okay? So in particular, given a family of maps from m to the disk with uh, energy bounded above by some constant times log epsilon, then for each alpha strictly between zero and one, the Jacobians satisfy a uniform C alpha, bound, C alpha dual bound and converge weakly subsequently as epsilon goes to zero to occur into the form pi times gamma, where gamma is an integral n minus two cycle whose mass is bounded above by lambda over pi, where lambda is the bound on that normalized energy. Moreover, any homologically trivial integral n minus two cycle can be obtained as a limit of these Jacobians uh, for maps such that the limit of these normalized energies is exactly the mass of gamma. Okay, so this is precisely this kind of gamma convergence result we were looking to, looking for earlier, which told us that minimization problems uh, for these epsilon Ginzburg landau energies divided by log epsilon converge in some sense to minimization problems for the n minus two dimensional area. Okay, uh, an important and subtle point is that note that under these hypotheses, so just these log epsilon bounds on the energy, these Jacobians ju epsilon are not going to be bounded uh, in C0 star themselves. So we're not gonna have uniform mass bounds on these Jacobians ju epsilon before passing to the limit. In particular, I mean, the, the mass bounds we would have a priori are in terms of the energies E epsilon without dividing through by that log epsilon. So the fact that we get the limit mass bound on the limiting guide by the limit of these energies divided by log epsilon is really remarkable. And it relies on some delicate estimates of Girard and Sandier, which give sharp lower bounds on the normalized energies of maps from D2 to the plane um, in terms of the degree of the boundary map, assuming it's taking values uh, in S1. Okay. So those are, uh, are really deep and interesting estimates that I won't get into here, uh, but I recommend looking at uh, in your outside reading. Okay. So what if we wanna think about general critical points? So building on the analysis of Lin and Riviere, Beth Welbrizzi and Orlandi uh, looked at the asymptotic analysis of epsilon goes to zero of general non-minimizing critical points of these functionals which are solutions of the Ginsburg-Landau equations. You can write down the euler lagrange equations in the O of log epsilon energy regime. So that's the energy regime where interesting stuff with the M minus two area functional seems to be happening. So translated to the setting of closed manifolds and for the details of that translation, you can look at the theses of either Darren Chung or myself, uh, their analysis yields the following. So given a family of complex valued maps solving these Ginsburg-Landau equations, such that their Ginsburg-Landau energies are bounded above by a constant times log epsilon as epsilon goes to zero. We can find a subsequence, epsilon j going to zero, for which the normalized energy measures, so the energy densities 
divided by log epsilon, converge weakly as measures to a limit of the following form. So we have a concentrated part, which is given by a stationary rectifiable n minus two varifold, and the diffuse part, which is given by the square norm pointwise of a harmonic one form. Okay, it's a bit of a mouthful. The hope is that this would be an analog of this hutchinson tonegawa result, right? Which told us that critical points of the Allen-Kahn equations uh, limit to critical points of the n minus one area functional. It's a little bit more subtle in that uh, now we have just a stationary rectifiable n minus two variable in our concentrated part. So it's not going to be an integral n minus two variable with an integer multiplicity measure like we had in either the Allen Kahn uh, or the geometric measure theory setting we were looking at before. And uh, moreover, we have this diffuse part, uh, which is somehow related to the fact that these critical points could just look like uh, harmonic S1 valued maps whose homotopy class is somehow growing in some strange way as epsilon goes to zero. Okay. But what are, uh, what are some of the ingredients that go into this result? Because it is a very, nonetheless, uh, striking result. So first of all, uh, a basic ingredient is that solutions U epsilon satisfy kind of an obvious monotonicity for the n minus two density. So energy is gonna grow like R to the n minus two. And note that uh, we don't have to do any sort of magical tricks to make this monotonicity work. There's no analog in particular of the Modica's gradient estimate. Um, this just kind of pops out naturally from the equations. Um, a major technical point is what's called the eta compactness or eta ellipticity lemma, which tells us that if we're in a, in a, re, in a point where uh, our map uh, has a value away from the unit circle S1, so in particular, if we're at a point, say, where uh, the norm of U epsilon is less than a half, and then our energy on a ball uh, around that point is bounded below by some positive constant times log epsilon. So if we have a map, a, a critical point of this functional, right? And the point is taking values far from the unit circle, then this is gonna force us to have some quantum of log epsilon energy blow up. Okay, so you should compare this uh, with the role of epsilon regularity theorems in the uh, study of energy concentration for harmonic maps, the Yang-Mills connections. Okay, and finally, somehow the main qualitative point is that energy concentration is driven by co-closed one forms, uh, which are just the pullback of R squared d theta under these maps, which we'll call this little j u epsilon, okay? So somehow these are driving all the energy concentration. And because they're co-closed as a result of the equations, uh, they have a Hodge decomposition into a co-exact part d star of some two form xi and the harmonic part h epsilon. So the harmonic one form h that appears in the diffuse part of this limiting energy measure is going to be exactly the limit as epsilon goes to zero of uh, this h epsilon one form here divided by the square root of log epsilon. While the concentrated varifold part is going to be given by the limit as epsilon goes to zero of this coexact part squared uh, divided by log epsilon. Okay, so somehow the constant, the diffuse part is coming from the contribution of this harmonic one form here, and the concentrated part of the varifold part is coming from the contribution of this coexact form. And note that this coexact form is determined by the Jacobian, uh, which is just the D of this, uh, this one form, right? So somehow, since we know that that Jacobian has to be concentrating around the M minus two submanifold, it makes sense um, that the concentrated part of this one form is gonna be coming from this, this coexact term determined by the Jacobian. And needless to say, uh, there's a lot of deep analysis that goes into making all of this precise. Okay. So in our respective dissertations, uh, Darren Chung and I independently investigated the min-max theory for these functional Z epsilon on closed manifolds with the hopes of obtaining some kind of PDE approach to Almgren's existence result in codimension two in the spirit of what Marco Guaraco did for the Allen Kahn min-max in codimension one. So indeed using a simple min-max construction, a two parameter min-max construction, we were able to show the following. So on any closed oriented manifold of dimension at least two, there does exist a family of solutions of the complex Ginsburg-Landau equations satisfying the, the hypotheses of this uh, bethwell brizzi orlan d result, such that the verifold part of the limiting energy measure is non-trivial. 
So what do you get? You do get to say that uh, this gives an alternative proof of the existence of stationary rectifiable n minus two varifolds, but note that it fails to recover Omgren's existence result for stationary integral varifolds, right? So this multiplicity function uh, living on our n minus two dimensional set here uh, can take values in uh, arbitrary positive real numbers a priori, okay? So in particular, this might seem like a technical condition. So we still have this, you know, n minus two dimensional set equipped with this multiplicity function such that they together form a critical point for the area. But it actually does make a distinction uh, in terms of the regularity theory. And in particular, having uh, only integral guys uh, means you have a much more restricted space. And we would like to know that our, our varifolds we're producing actually lie at least in that space uh, that Almgren was able to produce uh, examples of. Okay, so what's the deal with this integrality? So in general, this is an open question for the complex Ginsburg-Landau equation. So given solutions of the complex Ginsburg-Landau equations with this uniform energy bound, um, is it true that this varifold has to be integral, or more precisely, that this density function on the concentrated part has to take values in pi times the integers uh, for n minus two almost every point in that, uh, that concentrated various sigma? So by the work of uh, Fang Hua Lin and Tristan Riviere, uh, for local minimizers of the energy, um, this is true. And in particular, they can say that because they can show that uh, this pair of sigma theta over pi coincides with that uh, integral cycle uh, that you get by looking at the limit of one over pi times the Jacobians. So in fact, just sort of by direct comparison of competitors, they can show that uh, the limiting energy measure in that case uh, coincides somehow with the, uh, the limiting integral current, okay? So for local minimizers, we have the integrality. Moreover, in dimension two, we do have integrality by work of Comte Miranescu. Um, so in that case, they can show that the concentrated part of the limiting energy measure is just gonna be a sum of Dirac masses uh, with integer weights. But what happens uh, in general dimension for non-minimizing critical points? So uh, by sort of standard tools and flow-up analysis, it's enough to understand the following situation. So suppose we have a family of solutions on the ball with the usual energy bounds, such that the limiting energy measure has the form just some constant multiple of an n minus two plane, okay? So it's just theta naught uh, times some n minus two dimensional plane. And what we need to know is whether theta naught lies in pi times the integers. Okay, so what happens? Well, if we look under the microscope, so suppose for instance, we have a family of solutions in three dimensions with energy concentrating along, um, along just some line, right? With multiplicity theta naught. Okay, well, let's take a slice uh, perpendicular to that line. So if we look at a generic two-dimensional slice, what's the picture? Well, we see we have some collection of zeros, some, uh, some zero points of our, our map u epsilon, which we'll call z1 through zk. What we'll see is that similar to this, some of these cartoons we saw earlier, the energy is gonna be concentrated on this annular region uh, outside of an epsilon neighborhood of the zero sets, where u epsilon of z looks like just a harmonic S1 valued map, with sort of singularities with some integer multiplicity kappa j um, around these zeros, right? So it's just a singular harmonic S1 valued map just winding around these, uh, these singular points with some multiplicity kappa j. And in this case, uh, we can compute, um, and it takes some work to make this rigorous, but it can be done, that this multiplicity theta naught corresponds, if we choose this slice sort of generically, to the limit as epsilon goes to zero of pi times the sum of these degrees squared. Okay, so that is an integer. That's a, a good looking term. Plus the sum over distinct pairs of these zeros of kappa i kappa j, the log of the distance, z i minus cj over log epsilon, right? And you can just check this sort of directly by computing what the energy of this model looks like um, on the complement of those epsilon disks. Okay, so, um, so what do we see? So this Coulomb interaction term we're getting interactions between points that are coming together at a speed like epsilon to the alpha or some uh, power alpha between zero and one, that's the enemy of integrality. But even if we have integrality, notice that um, we're seeing the sum of kappa j squared here. Whereas if we were really looking at a nice regularization of the co-dimension two area functional, what we should really see is just a sum of absolute value kappa j if we're just counting these points in multiplicity. So somehow there are two points here. One is that uh, this integrality depends on understanding how, how distinct strands uh, 
of the zero set, which are uh, distant, but coming together, you know, at some slow rate, uh, understanding how they're coming together and how they're interacting with each other. And even if we can rule out this Coulomb interaction term, as Comte Miranescu can uh, in dimension two, um, we still somehow have some behavior here, which reflects the fact that we're not really seeing a straightforward regularization of the co-dimension two area functional in the spirit of what Alan Kahn does for co-dimension one. Okay. So in particular, while we've seen that the complex Ginsburg-Landau equations are closely related to minimal submanifolds of co-dimension two, and that's a relationship which certainly deserves further study. It's a, a fascinating PDE problem. We're maybe starting to get the sense that these functionals E epsilon over log epsilon uh, should not be understood as a regularization of the co-dimension two area functional in the spirit of Alan Kahn for co-dimension one. And in particular, they're more intimately tied to the energies of singular S1 valued harmonic maps. So in the next and final lecture, I will meet a gauge invariant cousin of the Ginsburg Landau energies, which does provide a pretty satisfying co-dimension two analog of the Alan Kahn story. So I'll see you there.